From a studio high above the clouds of the Okanagan Valley, this is the Cannabis Podcast. Exploring the world of Canadian cannabis culture, one toke at a time. Now, here's your host and bud tender, Gary Johnston. And let me welcome you back to the Cannabis Podcast. This is episode 126. Thank you for coming by. If this is your very first time, well, an especially warm welcome for you. Ahead, we have 30 or 40 minutes of cannabis information, and if that's of interest to you, you have come to the right place. Before we get started, let me remind you this program is intended only for those 19 or older in your jurisdiction, and is intended purely for entertainment and perhaps educational purposes. You should always consume your cannabis responsibly. In episode 126, we have a feature interview with Mr. Energy, Ryan Sprague. He's going to tell us all about his new website and program, Highly Optimized, for bringing control to your cannabis consumption. We're also going to find out that, you know what? Cannabis users tend to be a little leaner than the rest of the population. That's according to some new research. And some other research is telling us that you may not get higher just because your THC is higher. And on Cultivar Corner, speaking of getting higher from THC, it's a double-infused cone from Havana, the Orange Kush CK Live Resin Double-Infused Cone, one of the longest titles we've ever had on Cultivar Corner. All of that and more on episode 126 of the Cannabis Podcast. And let me also thank you for being here. I really appreciate that you listen to the Cannabis Podcast. Some special thanks out to Kevin and Jordana, who support me at buymeacoffee.com slash Cannabis Podcast. And also to Rob, Tony, and a big welcome to Roger, who's my newest patron on Patreon. You can find the links to all of that if you feel like supporting the podcast at the very top right on the show page. And now new research is indicating why, despite the munchies, Frequent cannabis users are leaner than non-users. This is a story from EurekaAlert.org. Despite getting the munchies, people who frequently use cannabis are leaner and less prone to diabetes than those who don't. University of California Irvine researchers have now uncovered a possible explanation for this paradox, and it's not good news. The findings are reported in a new study titled Adolescent Exposure to Low-Dose THC Disrupts Energy Balance and acid pose organ homeostasis in adulthood, published today in Cell Metabolism. Many adults who consume cannabis daily or almost daily begin using the drug when they are teenagers. During this time of rapid physical development, the new study shows cannabis can wreak havoc in the fine-tuned process that govern energy storage, making the body leaner and less susceptible to obesity, but also less capable of mobilizing stored nutrients needed for brain and muscle activity. These alterations are rooted in striking molecular changes that occur within the body's fat depots, also known as the andipose organ, which after exposure to cannabis start making proteins that are normally found only in muscle and the heart. Researchers gave low daily doses of THC or its vehicle to adolescent mice. They then stopped the treatment and after the animals had reached adulthood, carried out a thorough assessment of the animal's metabolism. The results were surprising. Mice that had been treated as adolescents with THC but were now drug-free had reduced fat mass and increased lean mass, were partially resistant to obesity and hyperglycemia, had higher than normal body temperature, and were unable to mobilize fuel from fat stores. Several of these features are also seen in people who frequently use cannabis. To make sense of this data, the researchers dove into the molecular changes caused by THC. What they uncovered was even more surprising. Fat cells of mice treated with THC looked normal at the microscope, but produced large amounts of muscle proteins, which are normally not found in fat. Muscle, on the other hand, made fewer of those same proteins. The researchers concluded that the effort required to make these alien proteins interferes with the healthy functioning of fat cells, and thus with their ability to store and release stored nutrients. This may in turn affect not only physical activity, but also mental process, such as attention, which depend on a steady influx of fuel to the brain. All too often we think of cannabis only as a psychoactive drug, said Daniel Poyomeli, Ph.D., and director for the UCI Center for the Study of Cannabis, the Louise Turner Arnold Chair in the Neurosciences, and professor in the UCI School of Medicine Department of Anatomy and Neurobiology. But its effects extend well beyond the brain. Its main constituent, THC, mimics a group of chemical messengers called endocannabinoids, which regulate important functions throughout the body. 
Our results show that interfering with endocannabinoid signaling during adolescence disrupts adipose organ function in a permanent way, with potentially far-reaching consequences on physical and mental health. The study was primarily funded by the National Institute on Drug Abuse. So there's some sober thought for you. If you began your cannabis use as an adolescent, that could be one of the reasons why you don't metabolize certain things in a certain way. Interesting study. And it's great how we learn a little bit more each time there's a new study into cannabis. From the Cannabis Infused Studio in the Clouds, this is the Cannabis Podcast. If you would like to discover everything you need to cultivate a conscious relationship with cannabis for a deeper connection, self-awareness, and perhaps a change in your life, then the conversation coming up is going to be of interest to you. Ryan Sprague contacted me about an interview a little while ago, and he is the founder of a site called Highly Optimized. Very energetic, very passionate about what he does, and it's a way that you can truly take control of cannabis in your life and incorporate it into your life in very interesting ways. We pick up the conversation just after I have welcomed Ryan to the Cannabis Podcast. Ryan, welcome to the Cannabis Podcast. Oh, thank you so much, Gary. It's a pleasure to be here, man. You know, it's not every day that I get to go on a cannabis podcast uh, with people that speak my language. So I'm really excited to be here, man. Well, excellent. I'm looking forward to the conversation myself. So tell me, where did your cannabis journey begin, Ryan? Yeah, so it all started when I was 16. And I found that cannabis helped a lot with my generalized anxiety disorder. And, you know, like many people, I went to a doctor and in all of five minutes, he came to the conclusion that I had general anxiety disorder, right? Not was experiencing it, but had it right. So of course, when someone tells you that, of course, someone who's in a white lab coat, that you've been trained and programmed to trust, I then took on that identity. And I started living into it. And I tried different pharmaceuticals, they didn't work. And you know, at that point, I was doing the Nancy Reagan approach, just saying no, because uh, I had had examples in my life of the lazy stoner stereotype with some people that I had known. Little did I know that it had nothing to do with cannabis. And that's a lot of what I teach now. But, you know, getting into it, you know, I found that cannabis allowed me to experience not being my thoughts, right? So in that experience, I realized I did not have anxiety, I was merely experiencing it, you know, and so what a realization to have at 16. I didn't have the words for it then like I do now, of course, but I knew something had shifted. And then like many people do, you know, I never got a user manual for the plant, I didn't have emotional awareness or any of these things. So what was a once a month thing became a once a week thing became a once a day thing then became an all day thing. And before I knew it, I was spending a lot of money and wasn't really getting the results that I was once getting. So this went on for a little while. And when I went into school for psychology, I realized real quick that I did not want to uh, wear khakis the rest of my life. So I realized real quick that I was going to have to make some kind of pivot, right? But I didn't know what that pivot would be. And so and in 2011, I went to the Boston Freedom Rally, which is like a big public display of disobedience where everyone comes out into the common and they connect with cannabis. And as long as you're not selling or doing anything weird, the cops don't bother you. So I went there and I heard this guy yelling, who wants to make butter with me? So I go over to his little canopy and he's passing out these pamphlets for a basic uh, eight week semester at a new cannabis institute opening up. So this is one of the first times I ever felt a hell yes from my heart. Again, didn't have the words for it then, do now. Um, but I went home being a rogue college student and I asked my dad if, you know, he would help me with the tuition because, you know, my dad and I, we would always been really close. You know, I'm an only child. I have a stepbrother and stepsister, but you know, when I was 18, I had a mortality crisis where I woke up one day and started peeing blood, had no idea why. Right. So I went with my father to the hospital on the way. He said, are you doing drugs? Right. That typical dad talk. Right. And so I said, no, but I am connecting with a lot of cannabis. I may have used different language uh, at that point. Right. So so in the hospital, I started showing him my laptop because I brought it in there. All the research I've been doing on cannabis. So to his credit, he had no cognitive dissonance. And he was like, hey, if this helps you, this is awesome. And so Fast forward and now I'm coming home to tell him, hey, dad, I found this cannabis institute. I really want to do it. Can you help me out? And he goes, I'll do one better, man. I'll go with you. Right. So he had never, you know, he hadn't connected with cannabis since, you know, the 80s or something like that. And he wasn't his thing, but he was just really uh, excited about something that I was excited about. You know, my dad was always um, my biggest support system, him and my mom, and he used to bring me to metal shows. And I don't know what the hell he must have thought was going on in there, but he was always really nice in that way. And so we go there. 
and I ended up just falling in love. You know, I was learning organic regenerative agriculture. I was learning everything about the pharmacology of cannabis, the physical, emotional, mental, and spiritual benefits of it, the real history of it, which is fascinating. And so fast forward a couple of years, I'm now interning for the school, the uh, dispensaries are starting to open up here, or they're going to be open up soon. So now I had a real in to actually make this a career. And in 2014, I went to a music festival in Las Vegas. And I ended up going there. And, you know, I tried MDMA for the first time. And when I did MDMA, I had done some research on it, of course, because I was still very, you know, scared of other medicines. And I had done some research and, you know, seen that it was a heart opener. I was like, okay, I'll see what that does. And so when I'm in the middle of the crowd, right, seeing whatever artist I was seeing, uh, this, uh, this feeling comes on. And I started having this really interesting, like, feeling surrounding my father. I didn't know what it was, but I figured, oh, I'm in Vegas. My dad likes gambling. We're going to steakhouses. That's my dad and I's ritual. So I figured it was just missing my dad. But when I got home, nine days after I returned home, he had you know, informed me that he had been recently diagnosed with terminal cancer. And so when I was at the school, right, at the cannabis school, I had been helping a lot of people with RSO, either beat or treat, treat and beat their cancer, right? Alongside holistic living and holistic principles, which I had gotten so into there as a side quest, right? We, they had a holistic health advocate there and I started getting into exercise and apple cider vinegar and I mean everything, right? So, you know, I start talking to my dad about it. He doesn't want to take treatment, you know, because he had just gone through a three-year stint of bringing his brother every single week to Dana-Farber for chemo and radiation, he had seen what that did. And he was like, I want to go out my way with my hair because he had a great head of hair, even at 64. <laughs> and so, so, you know, I had a, I had a fork in the road moment, Gary, where I was like, I could either love my dad for the person he's always been, albeit not the healthiest, but loving and supporting and all those things. Or I can try to shift him into the version of him that I think he should be so that maybe he can be around longer, but in doing so potentially ruin his quality of life as well. And so I had ended up being able to take the first path, right? And, you know, after a couple of weeks, he started experiencing some pain because I hadn't known at the time, he hadn't told me, but he had been diagnosed with small cell carcinoma, which is very fast and aggressive. So they had only given him until Octo uh, October, and this was in July. So I start, you know, we, we, we took our last harvest that we ever cultivated together because he had bought me a kit, we started cultivating, and I turned it all into RSO and I started giving him this RSO. Now, here's someone, Gary, who has not connected with cannabis since the 80s, now getting given RSO, like the strongest form of cannabis pretty much out there, right? So when I would give this to him, I would sit with him, right? Because I wanted to make sure he was comfortable in these kind of things. And, you know, I had thought I had discovered all about cannabis. I knew all the information. I knew how to grow it. It had helped me with my anxiety. And so I thought I had figured it out. But it wasn't until I started sitting with my dad that I truly discovered the true power of cannabis. And this is a lot of what Chris Bennett talks about in his research and everything, that cannabis is the ultimate connection medicine, right? First and foremost, it helps us connect with ourselves. And I watched my father turn into the softer version of himself. You know, I've always been a workaholic and all of these things. And here he was just you know, being able to create space in his life and, you know, him and I just chatting and watching movies and, you know, him telling me stories of his childhood that I had never heard before. And this was mind blowing because, you know, my dad and I did everything together, you know, so I thought I had this guy figured out. And, you know, this whole different version of him came forth. And I got to watch him have closure with his grandchildren, with his other children, with me, my mother, and most importantly, his own mortality. And so my father ended up lasting an entire 10 months past when his date had been given. And, you know, during that time, I got to really have closure with him. And I got to have experiences that I don't know if I would have had if it weren't if it wasn't for cannabis. And so as he was getting his scans back, his tumors were shrinking, or his tumors were growing so much slower. And so I had that extra time with him. And so after he passed, I made a commitment to dedicate my life to really bringing out the true power of cannabis. Because, you know, when we look around in society right now, there's a severe lack of connection epidemic happening. And so I saw this happening. And so after he passed, I ended up working in the industry for five years with over 5,000 medical patients with a range of different issues and would help them with a lot of stuff, you know, and really was really being a coach to them, you know, and I hadn't seen it at that point, of course, but that's what I was doing. I was helping them with, well, how's your sleep? How's your diet? How's your water intake? Things like that. And so after about five years in the industry, 
the company that I had once loved ended up getting bought out by a big multi-state organization, you know, the MedMen type stuff. And so real quickly, the company that had been family built and, you know, had really good value started to become more about money. So luckily this happened, right? It was the best thing that could have ever happened to me because it triggered me so hard that I had to make a change. And so in 2019, I went out to MJ BizCon and I went out there to find investors of my own and bring love grown cannabis to the world because I'm big on growing cannabis with love organically and everything like that. And I thought this is going to be easy, right? I'm going to go out there, find investors. They're going to see the potential and they're going to do it, right? So I go out there and I walked into the belly of the beast, man. It was like every suit and tie and, you know, person of that kind of nature was out there. And so on the last night there, you know, my girlfriend who had come out with me, she also worked in the industry and my other buddy who was also in the industry with me, you know, we all kind of looked at each other and we're like, well, this is kind of the death of a dream that we had out here. So, you know, out there, we had had a lot of expectations. And in this moment, our expectations had been lost. And so we decided, you know, I asked my girlfriend, I go, what do you want to do? You know, it's our last night in Vegas. You know, what do you want to do? And she's like, can we take some MDMA and go to a strip club? So I go, all right, cool. Right. So best girlfriend ever award. Right. So we take a little bit of MDMA, we go to the strip club and we have this beautiful night just talking to strippers and having a blast. They probably thought we were insane, right? They're like, do you guys really want to dance or anything? We're like, nope, we just want to talk. And, uh, and we had a great time. But what happened was I lost track of time. And so when I did that, you know, we ended up leaving at like eight in the morning and my girlfriend was working on a big project for a Chicago, Illinois dispensary. And it was like, you want to talk boring, Gary, this was like a 600 page legal application. Talk about like khaki vibes, right? So, so she went through this process in the strip club of like, oh my God, how am I going to get this work done on the plane tomorrow? We leave in four hours. I didn't get any sleep. And in that moment, something shifted in me, right? I took accountability fully for the first time in my life. And I admitted like, hey, this was my fault, right? Sounds very small of a thing, but it shifted the entire way I looked at my life where I realized in that moment, like, I have the ability to create the life of my dreams. And I had been living in a victim mentality. Why is this company taking this company over? This sucks, blah, blah, blah. And in that moment, I kind of saw our premonition of the future. And so when I was coming back on the plane, you know, I started asking myself, like, why was I able to feel like, like emotion, you know, like, why have I not been able to feel this before? And my soul started communicating with me and telling me like, well, you've been really good at numbing out your emotions with cycles of business and unconscious cannabis use. So of course, now my whole identity crisis starts, right? Because in the dispensary, people literally call me weed Jesus, right? So I'm this guy in there, right? And now I'm going to go back and say that I'm going to quit smoking cannabis, right? Quit using cannabis. And so for the first month and a half, I go back, I immediately quit, right? And it was funny because I had had daily headaches for about a year and a half. And I always used to wear my hair tight in a ponytail, right? I had tried everything, Gary, to get rid of these headaches. And so I go back to the dispensary, right? But I'm a different man. It's kind of like how no man can walk in the same river twice because he's not the same man and it's not the same river. I had that happen, right? Where the, when I went back, I decided, why don't I always have my hair up? I'm gonna take my hair down, right? So I literally and figuratively took my hair down in life and my headaches went away, right? So, so it was like all these things happening one after the other. And so I took a three month break from cannabis and about halfway through, I realized that once again, I was living into the victim. I was saying, oh, cannabis did this to me. And then I realized, no, it didn't, right? Like the plant never held a gun to my head. This plant's not to blame, right? And so after about three months, I decided to start connecting with it again. And this time I created structure around it. I started connecting with it intentionally and a whole new relationship was born from it, right? And so over the next three years, up until today, you know, I got into coaching and I started going around to these coaching circles because I have the background in psych and I loved it. And I started getting really into it. And, you know, I was excited to talk to these coaches I was meeting about business, marketing and coaching. And I would bring my cannabis with me, right? Because we did medicines and things like that there. And all anyone wanted to talk to me about was this cannabis, right? So it was really funny that, you know, I was looking to not leave cannabis behind by any point, right? But, you know, I thought, oh, I'm leaving that chapter behind. I'm going to get into coaching. And everyone was like, hey, man, how are you growing this cannabis? I've never had anything like this, right? And, and so I started talking to them about it. And they were like, hey, man, have you ever thought about being a cannabis coach? Like, I feel like I could use that. And I was like, I don't even know what that would look like. So I had all these premonitions. And as soon as I finally said yes to cannabis coaching, like, okay, I'll start doing that. All of a sudden, the craziest synchronicity started happening. I got to meet a lot of my idols. I'm personal friends now with Paul Check, Aubrey Marcus, Kyle Kingsbury, Ben Greenfield, all these guys I had looked up to for years. 
They hit me up asking me questions about cannabis. I've been on their podcast and it's just been this beautiful journey of following my heart. And so that's exactly how I got to this screen today with you, Gary. <laughs> That was amazing. I have to say, Brian, I think that's probably the longest answer I've had to a single question since I started the podcast. <laughs> it's, it's usually a long one. I try to boil it down as much as I can, but I feel like any detail I leave out will leave out a perfect part of the story. So I yeah, no, no, you, you tied it all together rather well. You used a phrase earlier on, though, that I want you to dive a bit further into because it, it really intrigued me. You, you made reference to the lazy stoner stereotype having nothing to do with cannabis. What do you mean by that? Yes. So one of the things that I've discovered in my studies and also my experience with cannabis is that, and this is not something that's not well known, right? But cannabis is feminine medicine, right? So it's a feminine spirit. And so if we think about the masculine and feminine polarities of energy, right? Feminine energy is all chaos and all like uh, potential and no action, right? And I don't mean chaos in a bad way. I mean like just beautiful potential, right? It's the masculine energy that puts that potential into form. And so what I realized was that there's not such thing as a lazy stoner, right? There's something called a lazy person that then connects with cannabis and it reinforces how they already were. And so, you know, the whole idea here is that if we don't provide an intention to the plant and to ourselves to understand why we're there, what we're looking for, etc., well, then how is the plant supposed to know what it's going to show us, right? And so it's all too often easy to, let's say, connect with cannabis and then say, oh, cannabis made me lazy, but it's a scapegoat, right? It's a disempowering state of reality when you give your power away like that. And that's, you know, a lot of what I teach people is that, hey, you have to take accountability for your own life. This plant is not holding a gun to your head. You know, it's here to help us, but we have to understand why we're going to it to actually understand what we're looking for in terms of results. Yeah. And I think that's the thing that most intrigues me about what you're doing. So I took a peek at the Conscious Cannabis Guide that is available for free download. I'll have the link available on the uh, on the show notes for, this, for the show so people can take a peek at it. And, and you talk about a couple of things that I have myself talked about for a number of years. Intention. Intention being, being very important. Set and setting as well, you know, really important to the experience that I don't think enough attention is paid to. But you kind of wrap that up in, into a little sequence that begins with intention. Give me a sense of what you're talking about there, Ryan. Yes, absolutely. So we have this four-step process we call the highly optimized way, because whenever I start talking esoteric, I want to make sure I give people practical things they can walk away with an episode from to go try out on their own, because I never also want to be a talking head. I want people to go test what I'm saying and find their own conclusions from it. And so the first step of this process for connecting with the plant and experiencing the psychedelic powers of it is to take a three day break each week. Now, this is not a random rule. People, it's not wrong if you don't do this. It's just that, you know, if you're connecting with cannabis every day, it's hard to experience these deeper powers because you have a saturated endocannabinoid system. That's really what's going on there. And so first step is to take this three day break. Second is to set the intention, right? Because the intention, like we already went over, will give the plant and you a direction to work within. The third step is to then create a ceremony, right? So this ceremony, you know, again, I think a lot of people think you have to wear white robes and, you know, be praying and all these things. And you can do that, you know, for sure. But it doesn't have to be that, you know, this is where I differ from a lot of people. I think things like a concert could be a ceremony. I think taking a walk could be a ceremony. I think life is an opportunity to have a ceremony in every moment of every day. And so what I always say is make sure the ceremonial structure is relevant and resonant with the intention you've set. So if you're looking for deeper inner awareness, you probably don't want to go to a concert, right? But at the same time, if you want to connect with a friend and dance, concert might be a great ceremony, right? And so make sure that your ceremonial structure is relevant to what intention you have. And some things you could do for a ceremony include saging yourself to neutralize energy, Palo Santo to bring in positive energy, doing a seven directional prayer to bless the seven directions, north, east, southwest, the sky, the earth, and to your center, to your heart. Um, you could use biogeometry, you do many things, but you don't have to, right? Like the idea is I want people to be able to make this their own and not think they have to follow rules to do it, you know? And so once you've done your ceremony, the fourth and final step comes And personally, if you want to connect with the plant as a tool for self-awareness, I personally believe it's the most important step and that is integration, right? So when we experience these PEAK peak experiences with cannabis, other plant medicines, et cetera, right? we're seeing a glimpse of what the potential of our life could be beyond our current limitations. And so integration is really where the work begins of saying, okay, if I know that's possible, and in my sober state of reality, it currently does not feel possible, what is currently lurking in my subconscious 
that is preventing me from being able to access joy, connection, laughter, et cetera, right? And this softer version of ourselves. And so integration is really where we get to take that PEAK peak experience and create what I call a PEEK peak experience, which is where in our daily sober state of reality, we start to experience the magic of our plant medicine experiences, right? We start to imagine, or we start to experience synchronicities, serendipities, chance encounters, and things that leave us in shock and awe of the magic of reality. And so that's our four-step process that anyone can take and dive into that. The Conscious Cannabis Collective. Yes. What's all that about? You must be pretty excited about that. Oh, I am, man. We're launching it June 12th. The wait list is now open. And this is a collection of everything I've been doing for the past three years. We have three programs that we teach, right? Three training programs. We have Connect with Cannabis, which is designed to help you create a healthy relationship with the plant and unlock the psychedelic powers of the plant to be a tool for self-awareness in your life, break dependency, these kind of things, if that interests people. And then going from there, you go into Coach with Cannabis, which is now becoming certified as a conscious cannabis coach educator and facilitator, right? Because in a $100 billion industry that hasn't even had federal legalization yet, there's going to be a lot of people that have questions, right? And so what regardless, if you want to facilitate this, educate people or coach it, there's going to be a big draw for this in coming years. And then it's also grow with cannabis, which is my program that goes into how to cultivate the plant organically, and also grow alongside your cannabis, right? So I have weekly energy practices in there, weekly wisdom and contemplation practices, and everything you need to know to be able to cultivate your own cannabis at home simply and save 70% of your monthly cannabis expenses. But the best part of the collective, Gary, is that it's an entire year together, right? So every week we have six calls in the calendar, numerous opportunities to connect with me, the team, guest presenters, live ceremonies, and most importantly, the bedrock that really is like the foundation of everything, which is community, right? If, if the world is truly going through what I believe it's going through, which is a lack of connection, it's important that as we're waking up and becoming more conscious, that we have other people around us that can allow us to not feel so crazy, right? And so, you know, that's what the collective is. It's a collection of everything I've done and bringing together people of like-minded uh, states, seekers, you know, as most people call themselves in the collective, to really be able to continue opening up and sharing and really experiencing what can happen when we choose to start believing in ourselves, connecting with life consciously, intentionally, et cetera, and having a lot of fun along the way. And so that's everything that's in the collective. I'm so excited for it, man. It's been three years in the making and just, oh man, I got to pinch myself most days to make sure I'm not dreaming. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you, you can tell that you have some excitement about it and, and it sounds pretty cool. And I like a lot of the philosophy that you're putting out. It, it, it makes sense. Well, one thing I always like to do, Ryan, with guests on the Cannabis Podcast is we finish up with my hot seat questions. Yes, Are you let's ready? go. Yes. Your favorite cultivar. Ooh, okay. So I have two right now. I'm going to break your rule, Gary. I have two, right? So my first one is Tahiti Lime from Archive Seeds. I fell in love with that. And it just has such a unique terpene profile. It really like, I have a cut I call the lemon peel cut. And it just smells like a lemon peel. Like, and, and you know, these days, most things are GMO or like that heavy myrcene like type smell. And so you don't really find cannabis that has that really pungent tangerine or lemon flavor anymore. Sure, there's tangy out there and things like that, but that's one of them. The second one is one that I got recently from my buddy Jeffrey Seltzer over at Keys to the Kingdom. Great guy that you should have on for sure. And he has a genetic called Eastern Rebellion. Um, I forget exactly what part of it is East Coast Sour Diesel, but he works with uh, land race genetics and he breeds and grows everything organically. And one of the things I've been diving into is the fact that, you know, if you don't breed your stuff organically and then you're trying to grow it organically, you're not going to be able to reach full genetic potential. And so it's yeah. been a big focus of mine to start relying on these organic breeders uh, to be able to reach that potential. So those are my two favorites right now. Joints or vape? Ooh, vape all the way. Yep. I love the volcano. <laughs> uh, good choice. I have actually burned out two volcanoes in the course of my, <laughs> my smoking career. That's an um, achievement, man. <laughs> it truly is an achievement. Yeah. I should get more recognition for it. Yeah, right. Uh, uh, your favorite munchie? Ooh, my favorite munchie. Apples and uh, cashew butter. There's a certain cashew butter. I forget the okay. brand name of it, but having a honey crisp apple with the cashew butter, oh, the best munchie of all time. Hydrating and delicious. <laughs> oh, excellent. And edibles or flour? Ooh, flour. Yeah, I'm a flour guy. Yep. I, I do like edibles for deeper psychedelic experiences, but flour all the way. It just keeps the ritual, you know, like a lot of, you know, what cannabis is, is not actually like the experience itself or not actually just like the flour itself, but also like 
what the flower can represent, right? Either rolling a joint or packing a bag and passing it around, talking to people. So yeah, uh, flower all the way. Well, and, and that would certainly hit with what you talk about ceremony. There's certainly yeah. much more in terms of using flower with ceremony. Absolutely. And this may be an odd question, but here in Canada, where cannabis has been legal for the last four years, across the country, people have a different term for 3.5 grams of cannabis. Do you have, a, what would you normally call 3.5 grams of cannabis? So I typically call it a slice, uh, you know, in reference to the pizza, eight slices of pizza. So I've known it as a slice, but also an eighth. But, you know, typically I would call it a slice. And then most people would be like, huh? So I'd be like an eighth, you know, and then they usually get it. So my personal uh, way of describing an eighth is a slice. <laughs> well, thank you for sharing that, because that's the first time I've heard the word, the use of the word slice. So yes. perfect, right? <laughs> you finished so with fun. a bang. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Well, I uh, really enjoyed the conversation. Thank you for being a guest on the podcast. Any final words for the people who are listening? Man, you know, first of all, Gary, thank you so much for having me on, man, and helping me co-create magic with you on the show. You know, this is my favorite thing in the world. Probably why I have two podcasts of my own. I just love it so much. And, you know, my final closing thought to everyone is, you know, follow your heart. It will never lead you to the wrong people, places, and things. Yet at the same time, it will lead you on an adventure that you would have never dreamed could happen. And all you get to do is actually subtract. There's nothing you have to do, right? It's actually just by getting still and listening to that deep whisper because the heart whispers, the mind yells, right? So the mind's a teenager. The heart is more like, you know, your wise sage grandfather or grandmother, right? You got to listen for it, but you can hear it when you tune into it. And so follow that heart and take the ride in life. Excellent. Well, thanks for being a guest on the Canvas Podcast, Ryan. Enjoy the rest of your night. Thank you. You as well, Gary. Much love. <laughs> THC, CBD, terpene profiles, what's in me? Oh, please explain to me. Go to the corner. Go to the corner. Oh, yeah. Go to the corner. Please explain this stuff to me. On Cultivar Corner today, we are trying... <laughs> you may be surprised by this, but I'm doing another pre-roll. <laughs> I'm I'm just astounded by how much the industry is changing and how big infused pre-rolls have become. Like they are definitely the top product that anybody is looking at and anybody's thinking about when it comes to pre-rolls. Obviously, those who are still into fresh flower love their fresh flower. But the infused pre-rolls are really huge. And this one was intriguing. Oh, because I'm always interested in stuff that is covered in keef. And this is one that is covered in keef. And we were having a debate about how can you tell whether or not there's keef wrapped. And the one ingredient that I have figured out is going to be there almost all the time is gum arabic. That's what they're using to stick the keef onto the paper. Uh, and that is obvious in this one. <laughs> What am I talking about? I haven't even identified what we're doing today. This is from Havana, and this is Orange Kush CK Live Resin Double Infused Cone. One gram. <laughs> Sounds delightful, doesn't it? In fact, it was that description that intrigued me. And the fact that it's covered in keef. I was also curious about that. So there's not going to be any Crafty Plus in today's Cultivar Corner. It's going to be all the joints. Let me give you an idea of what we're doing. So this is from the Havana.ca website. The Orange Kush Cake Live Resin Double Infused Cone. The Havana Double Infused Orange Kush Cake Cone is a one gram pre-roll containing a combination of live resin and premium fresh indoor flour, generously coated with keef. Utilizing our proprietary low temperature infusion technology, we protect the Orange Kush CK's terpenes so you can really experience the genetic lineage by Ethos, which is wedding cake and jelly bean, and sour tangy and rose skittles, and OG Eddie Lep. Get ready for citrus full body flavors. In THC, 30 to 38%. What is my THC? 38%. <laughs> there you go, right on the top. Now, unfortunately, because I have the pre-roll package, no terpenes are indicated on the pre-roll. Uh, ingredient, cannabis. What do we got? Cannab dried cannabis, cannabis extract, gum arabic. But no terpenes. And I'm not seeing any terps on the web either. So the terps are a bit of a gamble for us today. We have no idea. But it is a very attractive looking cone down to a nice tiny pinpoint 
and that cone piece, probably about three inches long, wrapped in keef entirely all the way down. I want to see what it does for me. <laughs> this is the Orange Kush Cake from Havana, Orange Kush Cake Live Resin Double Infused Cone. Probably one of the longest titles that I've done on Cultivar Corner. And let's give it a buzz. And this is a true Cultivar Corner, the first of the day. Oh, nice, nice initial flavor. Now, the joint itself didn't have a lot of aroma as I pulled that out. There were some citrus notes that I was picking up, but nothing heavy other than that. At 38% THC, I am expecting a fairly big bang <coughs> for my efforts today. And now, as you see, there's a bit of harshness going on. So I find with the joints, when there's a bit of that harshness going on, I have to take significantly softer hits, if I can describe it that way. It's a nice flavor. Not as smooth as I had hoped for, perhaps. But I'm finding that as I move on in life, the harsher stuff is affecting me more than it used to. Hmm. So I have just smoked just a little fraction of that puppy so far. Yeah, there is definitely some harshness to it. Now, live resin, I'm generally better with in distillate. So I was really hoping this was going to give me a nice big bang with a nice smooth appearance. Yeah, and the only way that I can get a clean hit without any of that coughing is to do a very light pull. Mm-hmm. When I do a light pull, a little easier on the throat. And I sometimes have to wonder, <laughs> with those of us who like smoking cannabis, when we get into a bit of a coughing fit, <coughs> we don't put it away. No, we just go back for more. <laughs> That's a bit of a quirk in our character, I think. Okay, was a little harsh to get here. Oh, but here come the happy eyes. Oh, my, 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 my. So again, the lineage here is wedding cake and jelly bean with sour tangy and rose skittles and OG Eddie Lep. This was a harsher ride than I was expecting today. I was really hoping I was going to roll this up and just have a nice, easy, smooth smoke and get to that glorious cannabis high. Well, I have achieved the cannabis high. It's coming on really strongly now. Happy eyes are definitely there. Ah, that burst of euphoria that we all just love. One of the reasons why I smoke cannabis is to get that little bit of euphoria going. A little disappointed that it is not quite as smooth as I had hoped. A little bit harsh. Again, if you do... Ease up and you don't pull as big a hit. A little easier to take. But I think you can probably hear in my voice that it's a little stressed. I got about halfway through the joint. Put it out because I couldn't take anymore. Now I am really high. It's quite an enjoyable high. <sighs> but it was a lot of work to get here. <laughs> Is it my old aging lungs and my throat that's more susceptible to the harshness these days? I don't know what it is. I had been looking forward to this for a while. 
saved it for first thing in the morning when you get the best perspective of whether it's going to really get that buzz or not. Oh, I'm very surprised at how harsh this was. The Havana Orange Kush CK Live Resin Double Infused Cone. Maybe the double infusion does it. It's not the Keef. I've had the Keef wrapped around it before. That didn't give it to me. If you're dedicated to the task, <laughs> you can definitely achieve what you're after, but perhaps a little harsher than I was hoping for. In my experience on this particular day, anyways. <sighs> my verdict's still kind of not decided on all of these infused pre-rolls out there. I mean, they are flooding the market. We're getting infused pre-rolls from everybody and everywhere now. A lot of them are made with distillate, which I don't like the taste of. A lot of them have some botanical terpenes, which really gets my throat as well. So this one, the ingredients are dried cannabis, cannabis extract, gum aerobic, potassium sorbate. Maybe it's the potassium sorbate. Maybe that's what's making me cough. <laughs> I'm trying to find a rational reason for why it was so harsh. Definitely did give me a buzz. I enjoyed that. Like the flavor of it, like the aroma it generated while I was smoking, but it uh, was pretty hard on my throat. I don't know if you'll have the same experience, but the buzz is certainly nice. Havana Orange Kush CK Live Resin Double Infused Cone. You're going to have to make your own mind up on this one. And as I am wont to do... After letting the cannabis roll around in my endocannabinoid system for a while, the high really is a really lovely, nice, strong high. Lots of euphoria. A lot in my head right now, but, but that good kind of head where I feel like I can get some stuff done. Not feeling a lot in my body as of this point. And my throat has calmed down a little bit. <laughs> I, I haven't felt the harshness like this one for a long, long time, so... A bit unusual in that, but if you can get over that, the high certainly seems to be worth it. Sharing stories about good weed while trying good weed. This is the Cannabis Podcast. And for our next story, we're going to Kenigma.com. This is a story written by Ben Hartman. More THC doesn't mean you get higher, study says. High THC cannabis concentrates boost levels of THC in the blood more than smoking cannabis flower, but they don't necessarily produce a stronger high, a new study says. The use of concentrates produce significantly higher levels of THC in blood plasma, the study found. Yet participants who consumed cannabis flower and those who consumed cannabis concentrates showed similar neurobehavioral patterns after acute cannabis use. A range of short-term measures of impairment did not change with the strength of the cannabis consumed. The researchers surmise that that may be because concentrate users have greater tolerance to the effects of THC or that cannabinoid receptors may become saturated with THC when consumed at higher levels. The study, published in JAMA Psychiatry, surveyed 121 users of cannabis flower and concentrate who were randomly instructed to purchase and consume higher and lower THC products. The study included 55 flower users and 66 concentrate users between 21 and 70 who had used cannabis four times in the past month did not use tobacco on a daily basis, and had prior use of concentrates with no adverse reaction, among other criteria. The flower test subjects were instructed to purchase 3 grams of either a 16% THC strain or a 24% THC strain, while the concentrate participants were randomized to purchase 1 gram of either 70 or 90% THC concentrate. Federal regulations in the United States prohibit researchers from providing any cannabis to research subjects that isn't produced by a single farm at the University of Mississippi which many researchers have criticized as being junk ill-suited for clinical trials, with levels of THC far below that which is readily available in the legal and illegal cannabis market. Some researchers have chosen to sidestep that rule by instructing participants to purchase their own cannabis from legal dispensaries. Between the baseline assessment and the experimental session, the participants were given a five-day period to familiarize themselves with their study cannabis. On the day of the experiment, the participants used the cannabis at their home with their preferred method of use and then were assessed in a mobile laboratory dispatched to check their short-term intoxication. The study looked to answer three main questions. How short-term use of cannabis flower and concentrate is associated with THC plasma levels, subjective intoxication and mood, cognitive performance and balance, if these associations differ between flower and concentrate users, 
and these associations differ in relation to THC potency. Cannabis intoxication was measured using the 12-Item Addiction Research Center Inventory Marijuana Effect Scale, as well as according to a 3-Item Cannabis Intoxication Scale that related three sensations, mentally stoned, physically stoned, and feeling high. They were also asked to complete four cognitive tasks, including three separate memory-related tasks and a quiet standing balance test. The concentrate users reported more frequent current concentrate use and exhibited greater blood levels of THC and metabolites at baseline. Nonetheless, despite this higher THC exposure, concentrate users did not show greater short-term subjective, cognitive, or balance impairment, according to the researchers. The researchers in the current study said that part of their motivation was to assess the potential negative effects of THC on the brain and that the existing literature is limited by the use of low THC products and drug administration approaches that do not reflect legal market cannabis use. They also said that the much higher THC exposure in concentrate users is reason for concern about the long-term clinical and neurobehavioral implications of concentrate use. So there you go. Interesting study. That higher THC in concentrates may not, in fact, be giving you a better or stronger high. Hmm. Another reason to maybe stick with flour. Let me once again thank you for being a listener of the Cannabis Podcast. I truly appreciate you being here. If you ever have a comment on anything you hear on the show, please send a note to info at CannabisPodcast.com. That's it for episode 126 of the Cannabis Podcast. From the Cannabis Infused Studio, high above the Okanagan Valley, this was the Cannabis Podcast. Thanks for listening to today's show. To check out more great cannabis podcasts, go to podconnects.com. Here's a preview of one of our other shows. Hi, my name's Kate, and I'm your host of the Pop Moms Podcast. I started the Pop Moms Podcast, well, because I wanted to end the stigma against using cannabis, specifically with moms, but also anyone who chooses to consume. I strive for a balance of humor and education, along with some pretty rad guests, to help combat social biases that come with consuming cannabis. Kids are hard. Join me for regular podcast episodes packed with parenting hacks, real-life stories, and of course, my favorite cannabis products. The days are long, but the years are short. So roll another J and take a deep breath. Keep blazing and stay amazing.